Recently, I've really gotten into the Yakuza series, and I'm kicking myself for how long it has taken. I haven't played any game with this much heart in its story. Each character in the main and even most of the side stories feel incredibly fleshed out, brimming with personality and purpose. I started my Yakuza journey with the latest entry, Like a Dragon, and I was quickly drawn to how personable newcomer Ichiban Kasuga is, with his cheery outlook on life and willingness to do anything for his friends and found family, no matter the cost, loyalty comes before all else, despite all he is put through even by those he respects. The limits of his resolve are tested but he stands strongly beside them because it's all he has. Preserving relationships is of the utmost priority to Ichiban. It was this attachment to Like a Dragon's lead that made me hesitant to go back and start the series from the beginning with mainstay Kazuma Kiryu. His stoic and serious demeanor is a stark contrast to Ichiban's tendency to always be smiling. That hesitance melted away upon starting up Yakuza 0 and realizing behind the rough exterior beats the heart of a warm and equally loyal member of the Tojo clan. But above all else, what really stuck out to me and struck a chord was the humanity of not only the playable cast, but every single character I've seen so far in the series. The big selling point of Yakuza is how serious and compelling the main narrative is, while at the same time, just how absolutely absurd the sub-stories can become. Ranging from beating up a bunch of grown men in diapers, to saving what you think is a pet crawfish that Ichiban throws into the river, only to find out it was actually someone's dinner. The line between raw crime drama and light-hearted fluffy side stories is very pronounced. You know what you're in for when you follow certain threads, but that doesn't stop the two working perfectly in tandem against all odds. And all of that is down to the fact the characterization makes sense. Everyone has a story, a reason for being, so even if a side quest amounts to menial fetching, that specific motivation of a realized character makes it make sense. But the thing that truly stood out to me personally is the way Yakuza rights criminals. When it comes to video games, criminals are often portrayed in either a negative or larger than life light. It feels like a lot of stories are afraid to get to the core humanity within characters who lead a life of crime because glamorizing so-called criminals might not look good to the public eye, especially one that already has a large microscope over the industry. Not all games are necessarily bad representation, but they can be so absurd that it feels like some of these characters are detached from reality in a way you're not meant to connect with them. Instead, sit with a glass wall between you and observe as they do what they do. Grand Theft Auto V's triple cast of characters, Michael, Trevor, and Franklin, come to mind as three possible types of representation for a life of crime. Michael DeSanta leads the life of luxury in a giant mansion in the hills of Los Santos, with a nice car, a house full of expensive furniture, but at the cost of his entire family resenting his existence and, as a result, their own. A life that seems unattainable and undesirable for most, almost as if to say, this is how successful criminals live. Are you sure you want this? Trevor Phillips is a trailer park meth dealer that is so excessively violent, crude, and rash. I'm not unconvinced he doesn't spend the entire game with grey matter on the underside of his shoes. His existence kind of feels like a comical take of a bad PSA that tells you what your life will look like if you stumble through the gateway of smoking weed one time. Franklin Clinton is the closest to a humanized playable character GTA 5 has to offer. After a life of petty crime trying to get by from a terrible hand life dealt him that eventually led to some jail time, he wasn't able to go completely legitimate since he was branded with the criminal stamp we as a society give people even after they serve the time we make them take. The issue with finding humanity in Franklin is how GTA 5 and the whole series really handles death. I personally think the absurdity of mowing down dozens of civilians and especially cops can be a lot of fun. There's genuine catharsis in just senseless video game violence, but it doesn't help me connect with a character like Franklin who, even in the canon of the story, kills several characters on a whim. The willingness to murder without the thought of how it'll affect the character and what that means for them as a person is what stopped me completely connecting with not only GTA characters, but a lot of video game characters who are from a crime background in general. There are many ways to present criminal characters. Sometimes it's an attempt at relatability, most times not so much. All of this is to say the idea of a criminal is kind of muddy. A crime in one country, planet, or video game franchise is perfectly legal in another. 
And that's part of what makes games exciting. We get to live out these wild scenarios where anything can go or where things don't make sense if they were applied to our situation. But when games are trying to ground themselves in reality, especially in real countries with actual city locations with real world problems and commentary on said things, it's hard to not feel a bit excited when I see a game like Yakuza get it right. My perception going into Yakuza was it was a Japanese GTA and that kind of put me off. On the surface and just gleaning screenshots you can see the comparison. It's a real world-ish crime drama where you run around and beat people up and the only reason I grabbed Like a Dragon is because good friend of the channel Maria Eurothug4000 kindly gifted it to me on Steam and wouldn't stop yelling at me until I played it. And I'm so glad she did because it changed my entire perception of what a video game crime drama could be. It feels obvious to say this, but people labelled as criminals are that former word first. People. Like you and me. And I don't think many people understand that due to poor representation in media, news, or societal biases. It's people who have been dealt a bad hand in life, whether it's the system actively working against them, like how the 13th Amendment is just rebranded slavery, or someone born to a low-income family in a less socio-economically well-off area making it difficult to get out. So they turn to what society has deemed criminal activity in order to make ends meet. Both of the main protagonists in Yakuza meet this latter fate, dealt a shit hand in life and told to make the best of what they have. Kiryu was raised in the Morning Glory orphanage by Shintaro Kazuma, the man unfortunately responsible for his parents' death leading to a guilt-ridden adoption of their son. Ichiban Kasuga was born in a bathhouse and raised by Jiro Kasuga and the women of the night. Both of these upbringings led to their respective personalities, stoic but kind in Kiryu's case, and personable no matter your circumstance for Ichiban. I'm not saying no other game finds ways to make gang members, criminals, or so on, likeable, but that their personality is bad doer first and human second. Yakuza found a way to flip that. These are people making the most of what is, rising through the ranks of their Yakuza organization to take it back from those corrupted by power and give it to the people of Kamurocho and Ajinsho. Am I saying that everyone in the Yakuza series, specifically those in the Yakuza, are good people? Definitely not. Absolute power corrupts absolutely. And there are some people within the clans who will do anything to take things for themselves. Just as there are people in positions society considers honorable that will do the same. In Zero, the three Dojima family lieutenants, Kuze, Awano, and Shubisawa, all serve as leading antagonists for different reasons, but all boil down to maintaining their perspective of what honor means for the Yakuza. Despite all this, however, they are still driven by a purpose. Kuze is a former boxer who believes in a constant struggle for self-improvement and despite wanting to kill Kiryu, respects his ambition. Shubisawa grew up in a politician's house and seeing corruption as just as rampant in government, saw there was no righteous career path in life. So used his wit and cunning to become a man behind the curtain for a different kind of family after his father took his own life as a result of bearing the blame of someone else's actions. Awano might be the least redeemable lieutenant, he craves only lavishness and luxury, with no mind paid to anyone else. His only goal is self-preservation, and using tactics even those within the Yakuza would consider underhanded to hold his position. He is also not only one of the few people to commit on-screen murder in Zero, but also does so to an innocent woman just to prove a point to Kiryu. We see a wide range of people working in the shadows of these cities, all grabbing for power in different ways. Police figures, politicians, property developers, and so on, all have a horse in the race to the top. Which makes sense, all these kinds of professions in real life require the same bending or even breaking of laws to truly remain on top of a system that hates people getting ahead. It's kill or be killed. Death in video games is seen as somewhat flippant. Unless it is a major plot death of a character either for protagonist motivation or the climax of finally taking down a big bad, it's usually a byproduct of inputting buttons and utilizing mechanics. Death is so frequent in games centered around action, it's hard not to be numb to it or even just say things like, oh, die already, when you're struggling with an encounter. Again, Yakuza subverts this. Both main heroes hate the idea of killing and actively refuse to do it. It's a big character trait shared between both Ichiban and Kiryu. So when someone like Awano murders in cold blood, it has a severe impact on you, the player. It's serious. Although the goofy combat may look like Majima, Kiryu, or Ichiban's party are straight up unlifing their opponents, their in-game cannon is just bad injuries, despite how 
life-threatening some of the attacks look. It really helps build on the idea of change and social image of Yakuza that the games want to present. One of the major recurring themes presented in Zero is centered around the morality of killing. Majima hasn't killed someone, at least at this point in his story, and is tasked with an assassination mission under the guise that it will change him forever. Once you cross that line, you can never go back. And it's not a throwaway line like in so many other games where a character is faced with a dilemma of turning into a brutal murderer, but shrugs it off to become a killing machine. It weighs him down, affects every decision he has to make, whether he can cross that line or not. Similarly, Kiryu's sworn brother, Nishiki, warns him of that same fate. Death happens in Yakuza. It is a part of life, and especially to those who are tied into the underworld of criminals. Ignoring it wouldn't make sense. But to add the stakes of morality and have it mean something truly makes it stand above others like it. Yeah, they are hardened criminals, but murder and death is not something to be taken lightly. Despite his gripes with morality, Majima Goro has a chaotic yet grounded sense of character. After spending his early days paying for the sins of his sworn brother Saijima, he's a prisoner in a city and a life he very much doesn't want. Managing Sotenbori's biggest cabaret club, once he finds someone he cares about and a reason to get out of a situation, his perspective changes. He's an agent of pure chaos, sure, but he has his reasons for being so. It isn't just a Trevor Phillips counterpart situation where he demands chaos because he had a shit life. He demands it as reprimands to those who wronged him and got him where he is today. In a lifestyle where being Yakuza is somewhat counterculture, Majima is the counter to the counterculture. Disillusioned to what societal and Yakuza norms may be, he chose a path carved by his own blade. On top of treating people like people who were born into different situations and circumstances that were beyond their control, Yakuza means something to me on a very personal level that I need to just thank it for doing so well like I've never seen before. This isn't something I talk about very much. A lot of people don't know this about me, but I guess I'm about to tell a bunch of strangers on the internet. I was born into a family that was, as I said about our lovable Yakuza protagonists, dealt a bad hand. My dad was put in jail at a young age for a crime he didn't commit taking him away from my family for 18 months and ruining any prospect of working a regular job again. Despite having served time to society, this had a permanent effect on not only his life, but my entire family's lives. He was forced into doing shady dealings with biker gangs in our hometown, using aliases and constantly moving to avoid police. After watching him and my brother go in and out of the prison system, I grew up resenting a lot of people for the way they treated us, like criminals. We were a family just doing our best with what we had, but as a result, we were ousted for it. I never stayed in one place too long until I was old enough to move out on my own. I had a lot of anxiety around answering the phone, because when I did, as a kid, it was either cops, gang members, or reporters asking for one of dozens of aliases. But after all that, I grew up seeing the humanity on the other side of the tracks. I saw these really nice dudes who just happened to wear patches and have shitty prison tattoos take care of me and my family. They brought us food, even one time on my birthday after seeing how much I loved video games and just absolutely smashing my one copy of Mega Man X on SNES for at least eight months. One of the guys asked me if I ever wanted to play something else. And when I said mom and dad can't afford the new consoles, waiting for me on my birthday was a brand new PS1. It meant a lot to me that someone who didn't really interact with me outside of small hellos, because let's be honest, despite my dad having prison tattoos and big muscles, he was family. Other men like that scared the shit out of me. That one small gesture really illustrated, even from a young age, just how much like us so-called gang members can be. They were just regular dudes who happened to have fallen into some shady dealings. Even here in Aotearoa, New Zealand, people in gangs chase out meth dealers from small towns because they don't want it affecting their people. They make lunches for kids whose family can't afford to feed them for school. They pick up the slack the cops and the government don't want to deal with because they're too busy trying to bust the gangs. Yakuza 1 and Like a Dragon both see main protagonists take a similar path at their starting point of our journeys with them. They take the fall for murders they did not commit. Kiryu and Ichiban serve 10 and 18 years in prison respectively. That's a long time to be kept away from the outside world. It's a miserable existence. Both receive letters from the outside world, then serve out the rest of their time completely in the dark of the world that's changing just outside the concrete walls. I haven't been to jail, but I know firsthand the effects it has on the people and those around them. It's not a place to reform. It's a place to hide people away for an allotted time and force them into free or cheap labor. And when you get out, if you're lucky, someone will be waiting there for you. It tears families apart, both blood and found. You want to help the ones you love when they get out. 
but society tells you they're still a bad person not deserving of as many rights, despite having paid the so-called debt to society. The Yakuza series has shown this kind of leaving prison in two different but equally accurate ways. Kiryu was lucky he had established himself just enough in the family that some people were willing to hold their loyalty for a decade. He has a letter telling him where to go, people remembered his infamous murder trial, and even without donning the badge of a clan member, he was still treated as such because that's how he remains to carry himself. It's all he knew and it's all he has been allowed to know without proper reform or reintegration into society. Ichiban was given a letter that his found family would be waiting for him upon release. Instead, he stepped out into an empty street, alone and confused in a world that has now moved so fast he missed the invention of smartphones. Can you imagine being locked away for almost two decades only to find out everyone is now looking down at their hands? It would do something to you. It doesn't just leave you without a support group. It paints a target on your back, one that is nearly impossible to let go of, no matter how hard you try. With the way prisons are designed currently, it's not a form of rehabilitation. It's a revolving door meant to keep you in the system, meant to dehumanize you in the eyes of your neighbors, and meant to strip you of your humanity. A humanity Yakuza doesn't let go of. That's why, like a dragon's bleached Japan, a group of would-be do-gooders who become disillusioned with the path of what's right by the sly words of a rising political star and founder of the group Ryu Aoki are a perfect villain organization. Aoki uses his position of power to latch onto people's idealism and has them fight his battles for him in the name of a cleaner Japan, free of low-life criminal scum, sex workers, foreigners, and the homeless population, all of which are either illegal or frowned upon so badly that even the idea of being homeless means you sleep in places you shouldn't, automatically turning you against the law. Bleach Japan's idea is to rid the country of grey zones, those people caught in the middle, doing things not quite illegal but not quite legal. The way they go about it though, well, life isn't binary of good and bad people. Everyone, even those who believe they are doing what's right, by them is doing major harm to the underclass and people who need a helping hand rather than a scrubbing out. Most people in the NGO aren't bad people, but instead people who are desperate for change and were promised it if these things were to go away. So they took to the streets in protest. People aren't born to hate the poor or marginalized. They grow frustrated in economic situations that keep them pinned down and are told they are being dragged down instead of pushed. It's what makes it so hard but so interesting when you come face to face with them. These are people equally as frustrated as Ichiban. There are a lot of parallels that can be made between Bleach Japan's false idealism and the real world, especially those seen within right-wing conservative circles. People who have fallen victim to the words of political figures who made them believe the real enemy is anyone below them rather than those who sit above. People like Kazuma Kiryu and Ichiban Kasuga are trying to get by in a world that doesn't want them. I know what their struggles are because I've seen them. It may be in different countries with different ways of doing things, but at the end of the day, they're written so authentically, I can't help but applaud the series for just getting it right. I'm not saying they're perfect, idealized characters of what should and shouldn't be, because the point I'm trying to make with all of this is they're just people doing what anyone would do, given the circumstances, and that's a point a lot of games tend to miss. Or trade in for cold displays of violence and murder that make no sense to the character, but it's okay because criminal? Expat Jake Adelstein, using his real life connections to the organization, conducted a review of Yakuza 3 by Real Yakuza, and they had this to say about Kiryu's depiction. Kiryu is the way Yakuza used to be. We kept the streets clean, people liked us, we didn't bother ordinary citizens, we respected our bosses. Now, guys like that only exist in video games. It shows the length at which series creator Toshihiro Nagoshi went to to make the games as authentic as possible. The whole plot about resort expansion in Okinawa and the CIA and the politicians involved and all that? Wow, that game came out last year, right? That's totally happening in Okinawa right now. The politicians and the Yakuza have always worked together. The game's got that right. Yakuza and politicians. Pretty much the same thing. We all have badges. We all have factions. We all have our Oyabans. Don't forget that there are some Yakuza who become politicians, and still are. 
I don't want to condemn any other game that has bad or misrepresentation of characters. I think it's an ingrained societal bias a lot of people have that they don't even know exists. I just wanted to shine some light from the perspective of someone who has lived the experience the kind of life characters like Michael DeSanta overly glamorize and satirize for the sake of comedy and plot points. Yakuza can be seen in many ways as the bizarro video game mirror to the real world, and it can be a bit larger than life at times to tell its story, but at its core it's deeply human in a way not many other games are or have tried to be, especially those about people born into unjust lifestyles. The games aren't always perfectly idealized representations of characters, and if you want a discussion of the depiction of women within the series, please check out this video by GC Positive on why Yakuza is for men.